Well, we're in the book of Ephesians, and this is our third message, and I, I preached two verses. And so, uh, and, and I, I, knew, I knew when we were jumping into this, we're, we're, the Bible is so rich to me, it's, it's so powerful, that the Lord said, Greg, I want you to do some key word teaching from the book of Ephesians. And so we're going verse by verse, line by line, and I'm pulling out different words and so the, the title of the series is Ephesians, The Power of Identity. And today we're really going to talk about what it means to be in Christ. Say it with me, in Christ. In Christ. In Christ. We're going to talk about that. And, and as I talk about keyword scriptures is that, see, before uh, the proliferation of the internet and everything, when I would study my Bible, what happens is that God would cause each significant word to jump off the page at me and I would circle those words and I'd write them down and then you know using uh, your, your Greek and Hebrew dictionaries I would study these words and it just became stronger and stronger and richer and richer and that was how I developed my theology so though I'm a man of great passion I'm also a man of great theology how many think it's all right to have both <clears throat> We have to have both. And this is part of what the Holy Spirit was saying as, as he was stirring me to, to do this, is that sometimes we, we equate the body of Christ that has passion for worship and we believe in the supernatural to be very shallow in our theology. And I do not believe that should be true. How many of you know that Jesus is the word of God? He, Jesus is the word. And nobody was more supernatural than Jesus. Amen? And so I believe that people that are passionate about the Word of God and passionate about the presence of God should also be people that are passionate about the depth of God. And so he's sent me on a journey to start teaching the book of Ephesians. Now, at this pace, we may be here six years, but is that all? So you're like, Pastor Gray, this is year four, and we're just made to chapter four. But, uh, you know, I, I just want us to, to not be shallow because we need to have a depth in us that can stand in the evil day. You know, Jesus said that, that the storms will come. But he goes, how, how did one house stand while another house was washed away? It was because it had a foundation. And I, I want you to be built on the foundation of the word of God. I, I don't want you to be built on, on Pastor Greg's faith or your mama's faith or your daddy's faith. I don't want you to be on Dr. Wagner's faith. I want you to be built upon the word of God. It has forever been settled in heaven. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word shall remain forever. This word is the foundation of our faith. And so that is why I'm doing this key word series out of the book of Ephesians. We're going to jump right in. Part three is entitled, In Christ. What does it mean to you when you hear the phrase, In Christ? I want you to think about that because in the next 30 minutes, I want to share some things with you that will transform who you are, how you will be able to stand in the evil day as you embrace your identity as one who is in Christ. Do you have faith in Jesus? Raise your hand. Have you asked Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins? Raise your hand. Right, have you asked Jesus Christ to give you eternal life? Raise your hand. Have you asked Jesus that when you leave this earth and you die, that you will go to heaven? Raise your hand. Is there? See, tell your neighbor, I'm part of that group right there. Well, see, you have made it to this group called In Christ. You're in. See? Now... Before you ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins, before you accepted him as your Lord and Savior, you were separated from God. You were an alien to his promises. You were without hope, lost in your trespasses and sin. It, it's a different place to not be in Christ. So some people are like, well, you know, that's just so theological and you know I'm just really into God and everything else with well, me you better get your theology set right. Right. if you're really into God you need to have a really into God theology right. and so I'm breaking this down because you see to be in Christ 
It's my greatest desire that the theological significance will have a deeply personal impact and effect upon each of our lives. I do not believe to be theological means that you have no passion. I believe the more I understand this word, the more I love the God who gave me this word. I, I just believe that. How about you? I just hide your word in my heart so I will not sin against you. Wow. See, that's what we're talking about here. Now, the phrase in Christ is found over 80 times in the New Testament. This phrase, or the equivalent, is found over 27 times in the book of Ephesians alone. That's why I've said that the greatest theme of the book of Ephesians is to be in Christ, which is an identity to be in Christ. And today, I'm going to just start digging in a little bit. Who wants to go mining for gold? Anybody want to go mining for gold? <clears throat> in Christ is the key phrase for all of us to understand who we are positionally in Christ. Now write that down, positionally in Christ. Accepted by God. Write that down, accepted by God. As one who is hagios or holy or separate, holy and set apart through the finished work. Write that down, the finished work of Christ. I'll give you a moment to take some notes. Praise the Lord. See, it is our positional righteousness that seals our salvation by the finished work of Jesus upon the cross. It is how we are recognized by God, the Father, as his adopted family. That was some rich stuff I just said right there. We had a family that visited Skyway for the first time today, and they, they commented on our cross. And they said, you wouldn't know how many churches that are retired now they travel. They said, you don't know how many churches don't have crosses anymore. And I said, we have placed that cross in a prominent place right above where we baptize because it is in the cross and the finished work of Christ and Christ alone that all of us rest our faith. Amen. It, it is in Christ and Christ alone that what he did on the cross, and we're going to talk about this, so what it means to be in Christ, what it means to have positional righteousness. Say that out loud, positional righteousness. We're really going to go after that today because, see, I think a lot of people, as I referenced this last week, I had such positive feedback from people who go, man, you know, I never really understood the the importance of positional righteousness, but we're going to really go after it today because our positional righteousness is how God views us as those that are in Christ. It is positional righteousness that seals our salvation. How many of you are glad that your salvation is not based upon the way you behaved in the last 30 minutes <laughs> or the last 30 days? You know, some of us see we're up or down. You know, how, man, I feel saved. I'm, I'm going to run through a troop. I'm going to jump over a wall. I'm going to cut off a giant's head, and then I can't find you. Where are you? Well, I just don't feel saved anymore. See, we got to get off of that kind of roller coaster, everybody. You, you can't be hot and cold. You can't be up and down. There has to be some roots growing inside of you deep, 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 deep into the depth of who you are in Christ. See, we have to, we, if, if it's all based upon how you feel, do you feel saved? Well, I don't feel very saved, Pastor. Well, good thing you didn't die. <laughs> right? I mean, we got to get off this merry-go-round roller coaster up, down, in, out, based upon our feelings and our emotions. And I need to wake up every day and tell my soul how it's about to feel. Because see, when, when I trust in the finished work of Christ, when Jesus said it is finished, he meant what he said, and it was true. Yes. 
when he ascended into heaven and he said to Mary Magdalene, don't touch me yet for I've yet to ascend to be with my father. He went into heaven and he applied his blood on the altar sheet there in heaven on the heavenly tabernacle. And when his precious blood and his righteous blood was placed upon that altar in heaven, it was finished. It is finished. It is forever finished. That is why I'm saved. It's not on how my week went. Well, it's been a bad week. Don't know if God loves me. Don't know if God cares. See, that's because you don't understand positional righteousness. See, when you're in positional righteousness, it doesn't matter life or death or things present or things to come. Sickness, disease, nakedness, peril. Just doesn't matter anymore. You can wake up when the day the sun doesn't shine, but it shines in your heart because you have a place in Christ where you are loved, where you are accepted, where you are holy, where you are blameless. There is a place in Christ when everyone else hates you or everyone else speaks evil of you, where you've lost your job, you lost your health, you lost your family, and you can say, it does not matter. I am in Christ. My joy is not based upon my temporary circumstances. I am sealed. I am bought. I am redeemed. I am holy. I am blameless. I am accepted. I am free from my circumstances. Suddenly, my soul becomes strong, and I'm not up and down because I know who I am in Christ. Is this making sense to anyone here today? See, it's our positional righteousness that seals our salvation each and every day. I cannot rely upon my feelings to determine what I believe about God's thoughts towards me each day. Say, oh, my feelings, I don't think God likes me today. Oh, God's upset with me today. I've had people, I've had believers tell me how God made them sick. If we being human beings are evil, how much who is God who is perfect, not evil? Now, listen, listen to me closely. I would never teach my child something by harming them. That's called abuse. People get arrested for that. God does not abuse his children. Come on. Come on. Yeah. I serve a good God. He does not put sickness in my body. He doesn't bring evil to my door. But I praise God that when I'm in Christ, I can stand in the evil day. When I'm in Christ, that in Christ there is healing from all my diseases. See, there's a place in Christ for me to tap into that is a shelter from the storm of a fallen world. See, it, we got to get our theology right, people. And people will say, well, I read this in the Bible, and I read that in the Bible. But if you come to a conclusion by reading your Bible, I was talking to a sister yesterday on Facebook about this. Somebody was saying, well, they've read about how God was killing all these people in the Old Testament. My word, how can anybody worship such a mean God and a bad God and everything else? The book of Hebrews chapter 1 said, in various times and in different ways, God spoke to us through his prophets. But today, he has spoken his final word through his son. And God is good, and God is compassionate, and God is kind. 
in God's final word to me and about me and about you and about us. That's why I can love every single person regardless of what color your skin is because you're made in the image of God. I can, are you male or female? Are you young or you old? Are you rich or you're poor? What color is your skin? It doesn't matter. You're in the image of God and God loves you and you're my brother and you're my sister and I'm thankful for you. You speak with a different accent. I love the accent from your voice. I love the way you worship God. I love who you are. I can go anywhere, any place, any time and be with people who God loves because I know how much my God loves you and I love you with that same love. Because I'm in Christ. I can love. I can love people who don't love God. I can feel in my heart his love for them when they don't know how much he loves them. Oh, that, don't, don't miss who we are in Christ. Wow. What is positional righteousness? It's the place we have while being in Christ. It is achieved through grace and faith. It is how God views us through the finished work of Christ. It is not based in works. Amen. Positional righteousness. When you accepted Jesus as your savior, this is what Dr. D.C. Martin told us in Bible college. So we studied these things. You remember Dr. Martin? We got some old, old Canyon graduates here. I love the new Canyon in their basketball team and Dan Marley, but the old school ones, we all had DC Martin and, and Dr. Martin, he'd take your hand and he'd say, when you're in Christ, you are in Christ. Remember when DC Martin would put his hand over that other hand? He said, you're in Christ. Isn't that a powerful, power? And I asked Jesus to forgive me my sins. And I asked Jesus to, to take away my sins and forgive me and give me the gift of eternal life so that I could go to heaven when I die. I am now where? In Christ. That's where you're at. And Jesus said this, whom the Father gives to me, I lose none. Come on. Come on. I'm in Christ. This is good. This is good. Now, this is what I'm talking about, positional righteousness. Are you starting to get a revelation of positional righteousness? These are the types of messages. Get the CDs, listen to it over and over, and it will completely revolutionize the way you read the New Testament because then the next thing that I want to reference is what we call progressive righteousness. Well, what if I have positional righteousness... What, what is progressive righteousness? I am saved, but I am being saved. Is there anybody here today that you're being saved? Is there anybody here today that that righteousness and positional righteousness is now transforming the way you live, the way you think, the way you speak, the way you look, the way you interact with people, the way you interact with your family? How many of you know that you could be in Christ that moment the thief was on a cross? He said, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. He was positionally in Christ. But if he didn't die that day, he would have had to grow up and stop stealing. <laughs> right? That's why, you know, Paul says later on, you know, says to the church in Corinth, you got to stop going hanging out with prostitutes. They're like, what? <laughs> See, we, and so different denominations, or what we'd say the body of Christ becomes segmented. Or we become sex. I didn't say that, that we, we are cults. We all have faith in Jesus. But a lot of times people will say that the progressive righteousness is the positional righteousness. And it's based upon your behavior. And it's not. That's why John could say in the book of 1 John chapter 5 verse, verse 13. These things I have written to you that you may know you have eternal life. You know don't wait for the good to outweigh the bad. Don't wait till, you know, well, I had a good week. Well, then you better die this week, buddy. <laughs> Push your chips in right now. <laughs> I 
I know that when, when I feel bad, I don't usually do well. Does that, that happen to any of you? He's like, man, you just kind of cranky and kind of out of sorts. You know, God, don't let me die now. I really don't feel saved. See, we got to get off that. But my progressive righteousness is how that I work out my own salvation with fear and trembling. That means let this salvation come into every aspect of my life. Let it change the way I speak. Let it change the way I view the world. Don't, you know, I don't want to just be like a baby Christian my whole life and, and that my life is some sort of duality that's saying that I believe in something but my life doesn't reflect it. No, I have this progressive righteousness that my life is progressing towards the high calling of Christ. Paul said, did we get positionally in Christ to live like the devil? God forbid. No, we're not talking about positionally you're in Christ and you live like the devil. But I want to stop living like the devil. I want to have the Christ in me live in me so that my life can be a light to other people. And that's called progressive salvation. Progressive righteousness. Who's progressing? Is there anybody progressing? Tell your neighbor, progress, come on, come on. Move, on, move along, nothing to see here, we're moving along. Right. And so if you can understand that the scripture speaks both to positional righteousness and progressive righteousness, you will be able to have victory in the difficult times. The, the difficult times don't mess with your roots. I mean, there, there, I, sometimes I watch flooding that happens in other parts of the U.S. and there's giant trees and waters halfway up the tree, but there's people in the trees because those trees can stand in a flood. We need to be like those oaks of righteousness. We have to be able to stand in a flood and let some people climb up our branches. Well, there, there has to be more to us than shouting and carrying on and then going home and living like the devil. There has to be something deeper inside of us. And so we have both positional righteousness and progressive righteousness. Does that make sense? I hope this is helping you. And I just believe in my heart this is something that God really wants us to, to get settled in our lives. And so we'll go through it. So I was asking the Lord, I said, God, why would you use so many different important words to explain to us what's happened when we are in Christ? There's, because book of Ephesians is like taking somebody and just dumping them in the deep end of a pool. And you're like, wow, all these big powerful words. And they kind of all mean the same thing, but they're all different. And so it isn't that they mean the same thing, but they are all built and connected towards the same end for me to understand the depth of what it means to be in Christ. And so that's why I, I find 12 key words. We're going to look at 12 different words, and I've been going slowly there, but we will see 12 different words that express and connect the amazing thoughts which God has provided to everyone who believes in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Now with this thought of being in Christ, everything I just said, I wanna to read to you 14 verses and just let it resonate. If you have Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and if you haven't, do it today. Just do it today. Listen to this. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you, peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him 
before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise and glory of his grace which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him with a view to the administration suitable to the fullness of the times, that is the summing up of all things in Christ, things in heaven and things on the earth in him. Also, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will, to the end that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, would be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. Amen, amen, amen. Give him praise, somebody. Wow. That's so powerful. It's so rich. In verse one, I spoke last week about the word to be holy, to be a saint, hagios. It means we're separated to God's purposes. And I also spoke about faithful, that it is our faith in his work, not our faith in our ability. There's a difference. If you're trusting in your ability, you will fail. But if you're trusting in his ability, you will make it. It's called finishing faith. Jesus is the author and perfecter of our what? Faith. I can't let him be the author and I become the perfecter. See? So finishing faith is found there in verse 1. Verse 2, that we understand about grace, that God wants to give us something. He just can't wait to give it to you. He's so happy. And you cannot receive it. You cannot earn it. You can, all you can do is accept it. You cannot create it. And that's the grace of God that gives us this incredible peace where we are in correct alignment with God and that suddenly I feel whole. Wow. Today, I want us to jump in with verse three. We are blessed with every spiritual blessing. We're blessed with every spiritual blessing. What does that mean? We are blessed. We have been blessed. Past tense. You cannot earn access to spiritual blessings. You just have to access your spiritual blessings. See, this book, according to the book of Hebrews, it talks about if somebody gives a will and they want to give something away, that in that will, the reading of the will tells you what you have received from the person that when they died, now the will came into effect. When Jesus died on the cross... Every spiritual blessing in heavenly places has now been enacted or executed on our behalf. When he ascended to the Father, he is our advocate, our one that is the right hand of the Father. He says, according to the will, they have access to this. According to the will, they have access. According to the will, they have access. It is available right now, everybody. Amen. Come on. Now, while he was still alive, the will was not enacted. But now that he's ascended to the right hand of the Father, it's available. Now, think about that with me for a minute. Could a homeless person have somebody in their family die and give them a house in their will? Is that in the realm of possibility? You are homeless, but because you're homeless 
And because you are unaware, could it be possible that even though there is a legal will to give you a house to live in, you do not access that house, you do not live in that house because of your inability to know, understand, comprehend, or have access to the information? Is it within the realm of possibility? So is it possible that people that have access to every spiritual blessing in heavenly places that we fail to realize what some of those blessings look like? Is it in the realm of our possibility? Think about that. And that's why we have to become students of the word or students of the will. Because even if you own something, somebody will try to steal it from you. See, as long as you don't have anything, people leave you alone. I mean, I always hear on the news how scammers get on the phone, and my, my dear mama and any of you of any age, my age or whatever, but don't be gullible to somebody on the phone that wants to get you to give money to them. You know, you're like, well, it was a good cause, or I had, they called my mama and said, this is your granddaughter, and they used her granddaughter's name and said that she was in prison somewhere, and that she, mama, my, her grandma needed to send money, and had my dear mama all upset. Praise God, she did not send them money. There are people that want to steal from us, and there is a devil who wants to steal our blessings that are available in this contract. You just, you just can't, you need to be smarter than the devil. See, people come tell me, and the devil did this, and the devil did that. Well, you're just letting him do that. He's a mouse with a microphone, and you need to get stronger than him. Come on. Come on. I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm telling you what. It's the blessings have already been settled. The will has been enacted. So what does it mean that I'm blessed with every spiritual blessing? God speaks well of us. The word, the word blessing, eulogia, comes from our, our word that we use for eulogy when somebody passes away and you stand up and you speak well of the person. So eulogia, God releases a blessing over your life. God speaks blessings over our life. Everything the word of God says about you, he speaks that, he sees that, he thinks that, he emotes that. Wow. God speaks well of us. God speaks praises over us. God removes the curses from us. Amen. Curse be every man that hangs on a tree, it says in the book of Galatians. So what does that mean? That when Jesus hung on the cross or called on a tree, when Jesus died on the cross, he who knew no sin became sin on our behalf. He became a curse so that he could take the curse out of us who deserve the curse. Does that, does that make sense? See, so he speaks well of us. He speaks praises over us. He removes the curses from us, and he consecrates us, and he sets us aside. He says, Greg, this is what I created for you. Go and find it. Go experience it. You can have it. I'm going to empower you to do it, and your life will be better for it. And I just go after the blessings of God because they are good, and they never stop being available. Wow. God intends us to prosper. God is making us happy. And God wants me to be sober-minded. <laughs> You're just cranky, dude. You're not being sober-minded. You're just mean. And you're blaming God. You need some progressive salvation, brother. You need some Holy Ghost. You need a little bit of oil to loosen up that leather. Yeah, see? He wants to prosper us. He wants to make us happy. God's intended blessing upon all of mankind that was released in Genesis 128 is completely renewed. Now, I don't have time to 
take you there, but I'll reference it. Romans chapter 5 says this. By the deeds of one man, Adam, all sinned. But by the righteousness of one man, Christ Jesus, all became righteous. Wow. Wow. Isn't that amazing? So here's God. This is what God says to Adam. Adam, I mismade you, and I don't know what else to do. I just got to go bless you. Bam. You read it. And he created man in his own image, and he blesses him. And all the blessings of dominion, all the blessings of rulership, all the blessings of prosperity, all these things that he was supposed to access. He says, this one thing you do, don't eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. When you eat that, you die. Now, what is the tree of the knowledge and good and evil? You're like, I don't know. I'll tell you. Book of Romans teaches us it is the law. If you eat only from the tree of life, Jesus is the tree of life. Jesus is the way of life. If you will eat from the tree of life, you will always live. But if you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is the law, you will surely die. And then here comes the serpent. And there will always be a serpent in your garden. There'll always be a serpent in your garden. Did God not say? But you're the keeper of the garden because you're already blessed, aren't you? You got a great big stick. You cut that devil's head off. There'll always be a serpent in your garden. He said, did God not say? And you shall become as God. You'll become wise like God. And God's nervous about it. And then Adam's like, okay. And so by the transgression of the one, we all became in bondage to the law. We can never obey everything 100%, be perfect 100% of the time. If you think that's what's going to finish your faith, you will die under the curse of the law. But when I am positionally in Christ, I am free of that curse. But I'm going to eat from the tree of life that gives me victory. And I'm going to eat from that tree. And so I have all these blessings that come from the tree of life because that's where we eat. This is making sense to anybody. So he releases us into the blessing of every spiritual blessing. Oh, we're chosen, verse 4. I've got to at least get verse 4 in today. We're chosen. Tell your neighbor you're chosen. Man, didn't it feel good when somebody picks you? How many of you, when you got picked, you're like, man, that's good. I'm like, I'm on the team. And then somebody says, well, they never won a game. You says, shut up, man, I'm on. I got picked. <laughs> but it, isn't it ill? You just see, like, you get picked, and you're like, you're all fired up because somebody chose you. Not only did you get chosen, you were chosen to the winning team. I read about our team in the end of the book. We're on the right team. Praise God. We're chosen. This is the foreordained, the predetermined, the predestined. Now, every time he talks about the word predestined, he talks about the goodness of God, the kindness of God. People reach wrong conclusions about God when they say that he predestined somebody to go to hell. He predestined somebody to never believe. He predestined somebody to spend eternity in hell. No, he does not. No, he does not. He does not. My God in heaven, he predetermined a group called the church, the ecclesia, a twice called people. We are called out from darkness and into marvelous light. He is called and he has given me the free will. He's given you the free will to hear this tremendous story, to hear this great news. And suddenly I have the opportunity. Do I want to be in or not? I'm choosing you, Greg. Will you come on my team? I'm choosing you right now. Will you step over to my side? I'm choosing you. Here's your jersey in Christ. Will you come over to my team and let me put my jersey on you and you will be on the winning side. I had to choose and say yes and so do you. Wow. Praise God. We're chosen. So this reveals the goodness of God. I'm going to end with verse 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 4 here, we're found to be holy and blameless. Now the word holy, hagios, last week we spoke about that. That means that we are set apart for a new purpose. That's why we're not saved to live like the devil. We're, fr- we're saved to defeat the devil. Now, 
But blameless, here's my last word that I want to talk about today, blameless, momomei, it means that God does not find fault with us. God does not cast blame upon us. God does not pronounce condemnation upon us. Wow. We are holy and blameless in Christ. People ask questions to me, and again, just because if you read the Bible, sometimes you don't understand things, but if you, if you will build a, a theological foundation of in Christ and a theological foundation of progressive righteousness, you begin to understand that the believer will never be in the great white throne judgment. Amen. Are you with me? The great white throne judgment, did you accept his forgiveness or not? You listen to me right now and you're like, well, you know, I'm not sure about this whole Christianity thing. You're allowed to choose and God will never stop loving you. But if you choose to say no, there will be a place called a great white throne. And at that place, every person who has rejected the message of Jesus will go into eternal damnation. That's the great white throne judgment. The sea gave up its dead. And the graves gave up the dead. And they stood before the throne. If you believe in Jesus, if you accept his salvation, you will never be at that place. So if you're here today, you're watching today, and you say, man, you're scaring me, Pastor Greg. Praise God. Let the fear of the Lord scare you. Amen. I don't want to make it sound like you can you know, have breakfast there. No. The great white throne judgment, all will be eternally damned. Separation from God. What a horrible place to be. Because when he asked, we said no. But what about the believers? It's called the Bema Seat Judgment. And the Bema Seat Judgment is where our righteous acts are rewarded. This goes back to the progressive righteousness. So we who are believers will once, one day stand before God and he's like, man, you believed the will, you took access to the promises and you overcame the devil and you expanded my kingdom and you brought hope and you brought life and you brought joy and you brought purpose and you prayed with people, you gave clothing to the naked, you visited me when I was in prison, you gave food to me when I was hungry, come, enter into my rest. Come on. He gives us crowns. He gives us rewards. And these crowns, we talk about the victor's crowns. And so the, the Bema seat is where the crowns of righteousness are given to us for every kind deed, every cup of water to a child, every time you sent money to, to take care of an orphan in India, everything that you've done out of a compassionate, loving heart, there is a reward for you in heaven. This is the word of God I'm teaching you today. It's a reward. So we're not going to go before God to say, I failed. I'm condemned. I'm blamed. I'm accused. That's not our portion. It's not our portion. But so many people who do believe in Jesus, still live below the inheritance enacted by the will. Because we don't know. Nobody ever told you what I've told you. I was visiting with a sister in the Lord. She's been in the Lord for so long. And she said, Pastor, nobody 
preach is what I heard today. Why am? Because I want you to be victorious. I want you to overcome. I want you to stand in that evil day. I want you to know that when Jesus died on that cross, he was thinking about you. He was thinking about me. He doesn't want you to live under that curse anymore. Now, will believers still get sick? Yeah. Will believers still die? Sure. Even if we raised everybody from the dead, we'll still die again. Lazarus was raised from the dead. He died. Paul said, if my hope is in this world only, I should be pitied by all men. Oh, I fight a good fight. I'll run a good race. But I will not allow even life or death to determine my joy. Because my joy is fixed on the finished work of Jesus Christ. what we hold on to. Stand with me today. We made it to verse four. Somebody should say hallelujah for that one. Oh no, there's a lot of verses there. Thank you, Jesus. If he doesn't come back, we'll learn a little bit more next time I preach. Amen. But I just think that we want to break off condemnation. We want to break off fear. We want to break off judgments. That's what the Holy Spirit wants to break off of us today. Does that sound good to you? And so even if some of you, you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, today I presented an argument where you said, man, I'm in. Why in the world would you want to leave this building today still not deciding for Jesus? Amen? So you make a decision right now that you're in. Because the gift's always available, but you have to choose. Today is the day of salvation. No man's guaranteed you have tomorrow. You don't say, well, I got to go live for the devil a little bit more. No, 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 no. You're done living for the devil. You're in. Make that decision today. Make that decision. Now, how many of us that are believers, and you know you're a believer, but you've been dealing with feeling guilty, feeling condemned, feeling less than, feeling like you don't matter, feeling like you don't count. Just raise your hand and help me out here. So who's dealing with this stuff? It's all right. We're all in family here. This is family. Dad's talking to family, right? And see, we're raising our hands because we're being honest, aren't we? But I shared with you today what the Word of God said, and the Word of God said none of that's true. Is that right? Is that right? And so everybody, let's all raise our hands and let's release a victorious confession. Some of you are making your first victorious confession. But we're going to make it together. Thank you, Father, Thank you, Father. That, you that you sent Jesus to pay the price, pay the price. That, I that I am free from the curse, from the curse. Of, the law. of the law. I am redeemed. I am, redeemed. I am bought. I am purchased. I am free from condemnation. I am free from all judgment. I am free from every word spoken against me. I am free by the blood of Jesus that set me free. My confession is in agreement with what God has written. And today, I leave all the chains behind me because I am in Christ. As one. Amen. Give him praise. Woo! That is a victorious confession. That is how we overcome. Our ministry team's up here to pray with people. You guys are so great. We just love you. You need more prayer today. Come and see them. 
I want to wrap up our service with prayer. Sign up today for our gathering that's going to be taking place at the end of the week. Do not miss it, okay? Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for those that gave their heart to Jesus today. For those that because their heart belongs to you got free today. That, Lord, a new foundation of the Word of God has been placed inside of us. Thank you for the Word of God. Thank you for the promises of God. We receive your blessings. You speak well of us. You accept us. You love us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, everybody. God bless you. You have a great day, a great week. Remember to pray each day this week for our gathering. It'll be greatly appreciated.